Hello, I'm Dr. Maury Gertz. I'm the Roland Seidler Jr. Professor of the Art of Medicine from Mayo Clinic. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Professor Raymond Comenzo is the John Davis Professor uh, of Medicine and is the Director of the Myeloma and Amyloidosis Program at Tufts University Medical Center. He also directs the Blood Bank and Transfusion. He's a member of the Board of Directors of the Amyloidosis Research Foundation. Also joining us is Professor Vaishali Sancharawala, uh, Director of the Amyloidosis Research and Treatment Program at Boston University Medical Center. Uh, seminal contributions in the use of stem cell transplantation for amyloidosis, has developed many clinical trials for the treatment of both AL and inherited forms of amyloidosis. Professor Comenza, I want to start our discussion today for you to just, if you would review your treatment approach to the management of amyloidosis. Well, I think it's very important to make sure that the diagnosis is secure at first. Currently, with some of the cardiology technology that's available, we do have patients referred to us who are told they have amyloidosis based on MRIs and the like but we determine that they don't. In patients who actually have amyloidosis, it's important to make sure you know what type of amyloidosis they have. The major types in the United States are light chain amyloidosis, which is a cousin of multiple myeloma, and transthyretin amyloidosis. The latter can be in an hereditary or an acquired form, and it's very important to identify the hereditary form when uh, you have a patient with transthyretin amyloidosis. The treatment of light chain amyloidosis is conventionally either uh, Cybor-D, cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, dexamethasone, or a more intensive therapy, which Dr. Sancho will discuss. The treatment for transthyretin amyloidosis, which is very, very new, the regimens have only been approved in the past several years, can uh, be uh, medicine for the ner nervous system damage that's done. Those medicines are patisserin and anodercin, uh, or medicine for the heart involvement that can occur with hereditary amyloid. That medicine is called tefamidus. Patients who have the wild type uh, transthyretin variant can also receive tefamidus. So those are the first choices. When you see a patient with newly diagnosed AL amyloidosis, uh, what is your individualized approach to these patients? It's very important to determine how advanced their organ damage is. So the approach involves identifying the cells that are causing the AL, identifying the genes that are within those cells, and characterizing the heart, the kidney, the nervous system involvement, the liver and GI tract involvement as well that may be present in the individual patient. You had a very important presentation at European Hematology Association this year with regard to combination chemotherapy. Could you elaborate on that a bit? In late 2015, the monoclonal antibody daratumumab was approved for use in multiple myeloma. It has become a backbone of therapy in multiple myeloma and is going to be a backbone of therapy in AL amyloidosis. The material presented at EHA in June involved 28 patients who were the first patients on a clinical trial in which daratumumab, the monoclonal antibody, was used in combination with standard therapy, cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, and dexamethasone in newly diagnosed light chain amyloid patients. The overall deep response rate was over 80%. Patients tolerated the treatment extremely well, and also uh, there were essentially no discontinuations of treatment in that group of patients. A critical feature is that the daratumumab that's being used in this trial uh, is being given under the skin subcutaneously in a volume of about uh, a tablespoon as opposed to being infused from a bag of chemotherapy with the salt and, and the added fluid that may complicate things for cardiac amyloid patients. Professor Santorala, your comments on your current treatment approach to the management of a newly diagnosed AL amyloidosis patient? 
So as uh, Dr. Comenzo mentioned, you know, it is absolutely fundamental to accurately type patients with AL amyloidosis to identify the precursor protein accurately. The gold standard currently is mass spectrometry-based proteomics to identify the amyloid precursor protein. Once the diagnosis of AL amyloidosis is confirmed and accurately secured, then I divide my patients into either they are transplant eligible or transplant not eligible. Transplant eligibility is based on eligibility criteria that are established by individual centers, but broadly they are uh, uh, based on the organ dysfunction parameters or organ function parameters, as well as uh, advancement, advancement or, or severity of the cardiac involvement. If they are not transplant eligible, stem cell transplant eligible, then the patients are treated either on a clinical trial or with standard treatment with either cyclophosphamide, bortezomib, dexamethasone, or if they have significant peripheral neuropathy, then oral melphalan and dexamethasone are the treatments of choice as standard therapy for non-transplant eligible patients. The goal of treatment, any treatment, is to achieve at least a hematologic very good partial response. If that is not achieved, then patients should be enrolled on clinical trials for second line treatment or they should be uh, offered standard treatments with novel agents. When you talk about a very good partial response, do you have a light chain number in mind that is a goal? So the very good partial response is defined as a difference between involved and uninvolved light chain of less than 40 milligrams per liter. You've been a pioneer in the use of stem cell transplant. Could you define your application of the technique in the novel agent era, your selection of patients, what fraction of patients uh, undergo therapy, what you see as its role going forward? So only since, you know, AL amyloidosis is a multi-system uh, disease, only about 25 to 30 percent of patients with newly diagnosed with newly diagnosed amyloidosis are eligible to receive uh, stem cell transplantation. The eligibility criteria that we use at Boston University Amyloidosis Center uh, pertain to age greater than uh, uh, 18 years with evidence of plasma cell uh, uh, plasma cell dyscrasia with at least one vital organ involvement. Um, NT pro BNP usually of less than 5,000 picograms per ml and left ventricular ejection fraction of greater than 40 percent. End stage renal disease, dialysis dependence, and renal failure are not ex are, are, uh, are not excluded if other eligibility criteria are met. Furthermore, autonomic neuropathy with systolic blood pressures of less than 90 millimeters of mercury are generally excluded, or pleural effusions, which are refractory to uh, medical therapy, are also excluded. So those are generally the broad eligibility criteria for patients undergoing stem cell transplantation. The stem cell mobilization regimen is usually just with growth factor. There is no chemotherapy that's unlike multiple myeloma. So there's no chemotherapy that is involved for stem cell mobilization. Stem cell mobilization and collection could potentially be uh, morbidity causing and also a, a stop gap for patients to proceed to stem cell transplantation because of complications that can occur during stem cell mobilization and collection phase of treatment. The conditioning regimen is usually melphalan based and it is generally speaking 200 milligrams per meter square of melphalan. Patients who are you know, older or they have severe organ dysfunction can also receive lower doses of melphalan at 140 milligrams per meter square. Um, and then the post-transplant care is usually along with antimicrobial prophylaxis. We do use a growth factor support post-stem cell transplantation and um, uh, obviously the blood product support and uh, other stuff. I've heard investigators in the United States state that with the advent of novel agents, stem cell transplant is unnecessary. Its utilization in some European countries is actually quite minimal. Could you rebut that, please? So you, you know, you have to come to my talk uh, uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. where I discuss the role of stem cell transplant uh, in the era of uh, novel agents. The long-term survival, the durability of hematologic responses, 
and also the durability and the depth of organ responses that are achieved by stem cell transplantation are nowhere compared to what is achieved with non-stem cell transplant regimens. They are much deeper and they are much more durable. The long-term survival based on our data of 629 patients and also from the Mayo Clinic data, as well as from recently published paper from the UK National Amyloidosis Center, the long-term outcome of uh, patients who have undergone stem cell transplantation for AL amyloidosis is uh, long-term survival of greater than 20 years occurs in about 30% of patients. Furthermore, the non-stem cell transplant regimens, uh, there is no long-term data and the responses are very rapid, they are deep. However, the, the progression-free survival and next time to uh, second line of treatment is quite short and we do not know what is the effect of hematologic response and organ response when the treatments are stopped because they are done as a fixed duration and not as uh, you know, for you know, continuous treatment. Professor Kaminza, your thoughts on the utilization of stem cell transplant in the novel agent era? Well, I, I think in both myeloma and in lichen uh, amyloidosis, uh, the uh, discussion on stem cell transplant has been going on for at least a decade and a half in AL and perhaps longer in myeloma. The fact of the matter is that uh, the factory that produces the toxic light chain and light chain amyloidosis has to be reduced to an absolute minimum in order for the organs to get better. With the availability of novel agents, combining stem cell transplant with novel agents is something that we've done for almost 20 years now. Initially with the first novel agent, thalidomide, uh, and dexamethasone after stem cell transplant, increasing the frequency of complete responders. And in a subsequent study, combining bortezomib and dexamethasone after stem cell transplant to increase the uh, level of complete responses. I think the earlier the diagnosis of light chain amyloidosis is made, the higher uh, the uh, proportion of patients who will be eligible for stem cell transplant will uh, become. And then there will be uh, issues of patient uh, choice as well as uh, uh, investigator and physician uh, guidance. I totally agree with Dr. Sanchewawala that the depth of response is incredibly important. And with uh, complete response, the median survival is really not reached for at least a decade and probably for a lot longer. So I, I think it's a modality of therapy that fits quite well uh, with the uh, novel agents that are available for multiple myeloma and will fit quite well with the new monoclonal antibody, daratumumab, and its cousin, which is coming down the pike, we believe, isotuximab.